In the 1930s, Cleveland, Ohio, like many cities across America, was in the midst of the Great Depression. It was a place of extremes, with wealthy businessmen and families having large estates and trying to keep up with what they had going in the Roaring Twenties. But there were also places in the city so packed with what was called the working poor that there were hundreds of families living in only a few houses. Kingsbury Run was one of those places, with its streets lined with shacks and huts that were packed with people just trying to get by and only just making enough to keep a roof over their heads. The streets were littered with cheap day labourers, prostitutes and people who travelled along the railway lines, living out of train cars just to keep warm. And it was Kingsbury Run that would become the scene of a string of murders so gruesome that they would shock the city to its core. The term serial killer hadn't been coined yet, and the concept of criminal profiling and psychology were only in their beginning stages, with investigators having to rely on experiences and gut instincts to make most of their decisions, and the following years would push those investigators to their limits. In September 1934, several witnesses came forward to say that they'd seen what looked like body parts floating in the waters of Lake Erie. Investigators rushed to the scene where they found the lower torso of a woman, with her legs cut off at the knees. There were reports of other body parts and that some fishermen had even seen the head earlier that day, but after a search of the water, only a few other pieces of the woman were discovered and the head was not one of them. This made it incredibly difficult to identify her as DNA technology was not yet around and they weren't able to get any prints. Without the head, they couldn't produce a death mask, which was a common way for law enforcement to get the public's help with identifying victims at the time, and without her teeth, they couldn't compare them with her dental records. The only thing they had was a scar across her stomach, which indicated the possibility she'd had a hysterectomy, but that was also a common operation at the time and didn't help them narrow their search. Her body parts were coated in some sort of substance that turned the skin reddish and leathery, and investigators believe that it was a chemical used in embalming or as a preservative to prevent decomposition, but with only that to work with, they weren't able to determine a cause of death and could only say that they believed that she was a murder victim. She was dubbed the Lady of the Lake, and due to the hesitation marks and cuts made when dismembering her body, she is widely believed to be the first victim of the serial killer known as the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run. Almost a year to the day, on September 23rd, 1935, another body was discovered around Jackass Hill in Kingsbury Run, also dismembered and covered in a chemical that turned the skin a reddish-brown colour and made it leathery, but this time belonging to a man, and there were no hesitation marks. His head was recovered, but he'd been castrated, with the coroner unable to determine if that happened to him before or after he was killed. Investigators tried to identify him, but it looked like he was one of those many people travelling through the city along the train lines, and they couldn't find anyone who recognised him, making him, unfortunately, the first John Doe in this case. John Doe 1 was also the last victim found with this substance on his body, which confused investigators at first. They believed that he'd only been dead for a few days when his body was discovered, but his time of death was later changed to be approximately a few weeks before he was found. They also believed that both John Doe 1 and the Lady of the Lake had been covered with this chemical by accident, with the killer thinking that it would actually increase the speed of decomposition instead of stalling it, and that was why it wasn't found on any of the later victims. But chillingly, on the same day that John Doe 1 was discovered, the decapitated body of a man was found at the foot of the very same hill as John Doe 1 on a dead-end street in Kingsbury Run. 
He was naked, wearing only his socks, and he'd been castrated, another thing that tied him to John Doe 1, but investigators feared that without a head, they would never be able to identify him. A search of the area found his head buried near his body, and the coroner was able to determine that he'd been dead only a few days before he'd been discovered. With his body in a far better condition than any of the previous victims, the coroner was also able to determine his cause of death, and it didn't paint a pretty picture for the ones that came before or after him. The 28-year-old Edward Andresi had died from the blood loss and shock of being decapitated. He had rope burns around his wrists, suggesting that he'd put up a fight and had at least been conscious for some of his ordeal. But this new information and his positive identification breathed a breath of fresh air into the investigation. For the first time, investigators had a name to follow up on and they began tracking down anyone who'd known Edward and there were many. He was a resident of Kingsbury Run, meaning that it had hundreds of neighbours and quite a few of them seemed to have reasons to have it out for him. He had a history with the police and a lengthy criminal record, and Edward was also rumoured to be a homosexual, something that would have made him a target for many dangerous people during this time. Edward was also rumoured to work and spend a lot of his free time in and around the bars and brothels of the neighbouring district called the Roaring Third, the seedy and highly criminalised underbelly of Cleveland, Ohio. It looked like there could have been any number of people after Edward, and this sped up the investigation almost as much as it slowed it down, with new avenues and leads coming in all the time that ultimately all went cold. Investigators were then left searching for something that could point them towards the truth when a new victim in this case started the whole process all over again. Another fellow member of Kingsbury Run was discovered with her body parts wrapped in paper and stuffed into baskets on the 26th of January 1936. It would take until the 7th of February for investigators to find as much of her as they could, but even then, her head was never recovered. The investigators were fortunate this time, in the sense that the victim was a well-known resident of Kingsbury Run, and they didn't need to find her head in order to identify her body. This time, the victim was 43-year-old Florence Genevieve Polillo, a local prostitute and small-time criminal who went by many aliases, about eight of which the police already were aware of. The coroner determined that her cause of death was a slit to the throat, bringing hope to the investigation that the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run didn't kill all of their victims by decapitation alone, but also the killer did something else with Florence that hadn't been seen before. Judging by the marks left on her body, the killer waited until rigor mortis had set in before they began dismembering her, making a break from the usual routine of dismembering the bodies almost right away. Florence had also been packaged and somewhat hidden, with her body parts being wrapped and stuffed in paper, put in baskets and then left for people to find. This was unlike the other times when, if we count the Lady of the Lake, she was tossed into the river and the two men were left out in the open, one of them even left on the streets with very little attempt made to hide the body otherwise. Looking at it from a modern perspective, here we begin to see the signs that this was becoming a game for the killer, and the idea of making the police chase after them and the notoriety that the Mad Butcher was gaining was starting to have an appeal of its own. We are able to say this from years of improvements in the field of criminal profiling and psychology, but at the time the only thing investigators could say for certain was that they had someone in Kingsbury Run who was killing people and they had no intentions of stopping. Two detectives, known for their hard work and their willingness to do what it took to close a case, were permanently moved on to the Mad Butcher's investigation. Martin Zalewski and Peter Merillo were adept detectives who both spoke multiple languages and spent a lot of time undercover in Kingsbury Run and the Roaring Third, hoping to coax the killer out, but it was Peter Merillo who led the investigation. 
He was originally from Ukraine and had worked his way up from the very bottom rung of the police force ladder to become the well-respected detective that he was, but then he was handed the enormous task of manning the investigation into the murders of Kingsbury Run and it was an investigation that would almost bring the department to its knees. By then, news about the butcher of Kingsbury Run was circulating like wildfire, casting an unfriendly light onto the department and their inability to catch the killer, and this all came to a head when another body was discovered. On the 5th of June 1936, the decapitated body of a man was discovered outside the Nickel Plate Railroad Police Building, so far making it the most daring drop-off from the killer by far. No one had seen who'd left the body there, but police were hopeful that there would be another positive identification when the victim's head was discovered under a bridge further away from the police station. It looked like he'd been killed only a few days before, leaving his features in fairly good condition when the police created a death mask of him. He was estimated to be around 20 to 23 years old. He had a tall and slender build with brown eyes and reddish brown hair, but perhaps what brought the most confidence to investigators that he would be identified was that he had six quite distinctive tattoos. Tattoos were not a common thing to have in that time period, particularly among the average citizens, with people who did have them usually either being criminals or sailors, and it looked like the investigators had a sailor on their hands. On the inside of his left upper arm, he had a bird with a band underneath it with two names, Helen and Paul. On the outside of his right arm, he had a heart with an anchor. On the inside, he had a flag with the initials WCG, a butterfly on his left shoulder, a comic strip character on his left ankle, and Cupid on his right. He was also wearing underwear that had the initials JD on a tag inside them, but between all those names, all those initials, and the estimated thousands of residents who saw his death mask, it appeared that nobody knew his identity. John Doe too was given the nickname The Tattooed Man, and that was about as close as the investigators ever got to identifying him. The tattooed man had been drained of blood and his head had been removed while he was still alive. This new information was enough for investigators to add more pressure onto themselves to solve the case and the investigation into the tattooed man brought a lot of unwanted attention onto the police department from the outside as well. But just over a month later, on the 22nd of July 1936, things would escalate further. Another body was discovered in the Big Creek area of Brooklyn, Cleveland, but to call the waters a lake is a bit of a stretch as the place where this victim was found was more like a cesspool and full of human waste. This and the fact that the estimated time of death of the victim was two months before he was actually discovered added to the speed of decomposition and made both identifying and collecting his body incredibly difficult. Investigators brought a diver in to search the waters for more body parts, all under the watchful eyes of about 600 onlookers, some rumours spreading that the killer was amongst them. It's certainly possible that they were. It would certainly seem to be in keeping with the behaviour they'd shown before when they'd left the tattooed man's body in front of the police building and managed to get away, but who knows if they were really there that day. What we do know for certain is what was in the autopsy report for John Doe 3, otherwise known as the West Side Victim. The report estimated that he was in his late 20s and, again, his cause of death was decapitation. By then, still working on hunches and not any sort of system or profile, the coroner claimed that he believed the killer was someone who was familiar with anatomy. He cited the lack of hesitation marks seen on the bodies and bones, and that the victims seemed to have been decapitated in one clean stroke. This at least seemed to imply that their deaths were relatively quick and painless, but it did set up a rather chilling list of suspects for the investigators to look into. Lead investigator in the case, Peter Merillo, agreed with this, once speaking to the Cleveland Press about the type of person they were looking to find. He said, quote, The murderer is a sex degenerate. 
going on to imply that the killer could even be a necrophiliac who, quote, may have worked in the pathology department of some hospital, morgue, or some college where he had the opportunity to handle a great number of bodies, or may have been employed in some undertaking establishment. He went on to say that they were looking for someone who had a, quote, mania for headless nude bodies. It looked like Peter Merlo and the coroners were on the same page and had the same idea of who they should be looking for, but this also unfortunately came at a time where the police department was under mounting pressure not only from the public but from upper management as well. The mayor of Cleveland, Harold Burton, had recently appointed Elliot Ness as safety director and he was a big fish in a small pond. Elliot Ness was once described as an energetic and single-minded person with an incredible mind for strategies. He was first hired as a trainee in the US Treasury Department's Chicago office in 1926 and was then transferred to the Probation Enforcement Unit, where he quickly made a name for himself. He was unrelenting, unbreakable and had a fierce dedication to upholding the law, and then he was put on a team of men who worked diligently to shut down illegal liquor distributions. He and his team's dedication only grew when one of the members was beaten and shot dead for his work as their translator and chauffeur, and Elliot Ness got his chance to get back at the people who killed his teammate and friend when he was put in charge of a particularly special team. Elliot named them the Untouchables because they were the type of men who were able to work on the streets and put away dangerous criminals without being touched and becoming, quote, dirty. They didn't take bribes. They were healthy, fit men who didn't have families and were entirely dedicated to the job, and they had a mammoth of an opponent to take down. They were the team in charge of disrupting Al Capone's liquor distributions, and Elliot took his job incredibly seriously, even going as far to parade the vans that they'd apprehended from Al Capone's men past Capone's window to taunt him. And Elliot Ness was fresh off the success of being part of the strategy that had put the infamous Al Capone behind bars when he was asked to come to Cleveland in 1935 to help weed out the corruption within the police department. Elliot came down hard, demoting corrupt police officers and promoting the ones who did well. And then in 1936, the Kingsbury Run killings brought unwanted negative attention back on the department. Ness was unofficially put in charge of the investigation to help put the public at ease that something was being done to catch the killer, but he had few intentions of working with Peter Merlo and Martin Zalewski. Instead, he began his own separate investigation, most of them coming to the same conclusions when he set his sights on looking for a deranged man with a background or experience in medicine, but neither team seemed to be getting any closer to actually catching a suspect. In September 1936, another two halves of a male torso and his lower legs were found in a creek in Kingsbury Run. His kidneys had been cut out, his stomach had been sliced and he'd been castrated. But without more body parts to work with, the coroner couldn't say much else. The fire department dredged the water to look for more, but when they couldn't find any more pieces, the coroner determined the victim's cause of death to probably be decapitation. In June 1937, the only known African-American victim of the butcher of Kingsbury Run was found when the decapitated body of a woman was found underneath the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge. A search of the area led investigators to find her head, and a search of the body discovered that she was missing a rib. She was badly decomposed, leading the coroner to place her time of death as approximately a year before she was found. But with her head found as evidence, there was still a lot of hope that she would be positively identified. Dental records came back with a possible identification that pointed them to a woman named Rose Wallace. Her son was asked to come in and take a look at what the police had, including her dental records, and he believed that it was his mother. He'd reported her missing about 10 months prior to when she was found, but the police only made a tentative identification because her body was so badly decomposed, and the dentist who'd done work on her teeth had already died and therefore couldn't confirm that the work done to her teeth had been done by him. 
A little later in the summer of 1937, the body of another Jane Doe and another John Doe were found in the Cleveland Flats, where they were pulled out of a creek. Both had been dismembered, with some body parts floating in the water, but John Doe 5's upper torso was found in a burlap sack that was originally for chicken feed. He'd been gutted and his heart had been pulled out of his chest. Jane Doe 3 was found in a similar circumstance in April 1938 in the Cuyahoga River. A labourer on his way to work that morning saw what he believed to be a dead fish floating in the water, but when he took a closer look, he discovered it was actually a human leg. Investigators rushed to the water where they found the floating lower leg of a woman, but that was all they found until May 1938, when they found the thigh near a bridge. Under that bridge, they found a burlap sack with two halves of her torso, her other thigh and her left foot. By now, both the department and Elliot Ness were feeling the public and media pressure to arrest someone and get the killer off the streets, and they may have thought that everything was behind them when the killer went quiet for a few months, but he would be back with his boldest move yet. On the 16th of August, 1938, two bodies were found on the shore of a lake. John Doe 6 and Jane Doe 4 had both been decapitated. Their limbs had been amputated, but both heads were recovered. The shocking part of their discovery was that they were found on a piece of shoreline that was directly visible from Elliot Ness's office window. The Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run was back to his games, and he was back with a vengeance. Who's to say if he had really been quiet during those months, or if his victims had simply not been found, but he certainly wanted the investigators and the public to know that he was still around when he left those two victims right outside Elliot Ness's office. And Elliot Ness responded. At 12.40am on the 22nd of August, Elliot led a team of 35 policemen and detectives into Kingsbury Run. Eleven police cars, two vans and three fire trucks charged into the streets in the middle of the night, sweeping the area and pushing all of the residents out. By morning they had 63 men in custody and they had the place to themselves. Ness and investigators picked through the shacks looking for anything that they could find that would point them towards the killer, but they could not find anything substantial and instead of letting the residents return to their homes, which for most of them were the only homes that they could afford to live in, Ness ordered that they all be burned to the ground. The fire brigade followed his orders and the streets of Kingsbury Run were gone, taking with them any potential evidence, but Ness claimed that this was all done in an attempt to keep the residents of Kingsbury Run safe. He said that he was removing the killer from his hunting grounds and that he hoped that this would bring an end to the murders, but the media came down hard on him and the department and the public only grew more angry and frustrated with him as well. But in some ways, Elliot Ness proved his point. The killings did actually stop, but there could have been a few reasons behind that and not many of them had to do with the raid on Kingsbury Run. Elliot Ness claimed that he knew the killer. Still working separately from the other team, he brought in Dr Francis E Sweeney for questioning and he seemed to fit the bill. Dr Francis had lived a hard life, growing up in Kingsbury Run and losing both of his parents when he was very young. He first tried to support himself by working any job he could, but then he decided to make a better life for himself and managed to get into school. He still worked full time but put himself through an undergraduate pharmacy school and then medical school where he did so well that his classmates elected him as vice president in his sophomore year. By the time he graduated in 1928, he was at the start of a promising career, but by then he was also a deeply troubled man with a dark past. His difficult upbringing aside, Dr Francis had also volunteered as a medical officer during the First World War, where he worked on the front lines, treating wounded and dying soldiers, and had been the victim of a gas attack that left him with permanent nerve damage. Who can say for sure what he must have witnessed, but there are reports that he'd taken part in several amputations, perhaps setting the scene for what was to come. But in 1929, things took even more of a drastic turn for Dr Francis when, still fresh from his medical school degree, he was diagnosed as having paranoid schizophrenia. 
He was still hired at the St Alexis Hospital in Kingsbury Run, but when Elliot Ness and his team came to talk with him, they found that he was left largely unattended and could spend his time at the hospital mainly doing whatever he wanted. He was an alcoholic with anxiety and depression from his experiences at war, and his office was right beside the morgue, which would have provided the perfect place for him to dismember bodies and clean up after himself without getting caught. From the outside looking in, it looked like Elliot had his man, but there was just one problem. They couldn't speak to him. When Elliot and his team had picked Dr Francis up, he'd been incredibly intoxicated. They actually had to put him in a hotel for three whole days before he was sober enough to talk to them. They held him for several more days and put him through early forms of polygraph tests, which he failed, but he never admitted to being the killer. Perhaps if Dr Francis Sweeney had been anyone else, Elliot Ness would have kept him detained until he confessed and that they could prosecute him, but Dr Francis was the first cousin of one of Ness's political rivals, Congressman Martin L Sweeney. Martin Sweeney had been publicly attacking Elliot Ness for not being able to catch the killer, and now with Elliot bringing his cousin in for questioning, it gave Sweeney all the room to say that Elliot was doing it for personal reasons. Elliot was backed into a corner, and with no confession or physical evidence to tie Dr Francis to the crimes, he had to let him go. Dr Francis almost immediately admitted himself into a mental hospital for veterans, where he stayed for the rest of his life, but he found himself a new passion while he was there. He sent Elliot Ness and his family taunting and threatening postcards, teasing him from his hospital room, and admitted to nothing for the rest of his life. Elliot would tell the press that he knew who the killer was, and he couldn't prosecute him, heavily implying to the whole world that it was Dr Francis Sweeney. And the murders did actually stop with that raid and the burning of Kingsbury Run, but there was still one more victim in this case, and it would come almost a full year after the raid. In July of 1939, County Sheriff Martin O'Donnell arrested an immigrant from the Czech Republic by the name of Frank Dolezal. He was a 52-year-old bricklayer, and Martin O'Donnell charged him with the murder of Florence Genevieve Polillo, the killer's third known victim. By then, the department had interviewed an estimated 9,000 people in connection with the murders, desperately searching for someone who connected to more than one victim, and Frank Dolezal did just that. He had lived with Florence at one point, and he also had ties to both Edward Andrassy and Rose Wallace, something that isn't difficult to imagine how that would be possible when hundreds of residents were living together in the shacks at Kingsbury Run. But the sheriff believed that there was enough evidence to charge Frank Dolezal, and by then, the untouchable and famous Elliot Ness had come out and said that there wouldn't be an arrest in the case, so he had more reason than ever to try to prove himself and the department. Frank Dolezal was brought in and put through intense hours of interrogation. He eventually confessed, which turned out to be a long rant of barely coherent sentences, followed by strangely detailed and descriptive facts about the murders, and then a court date was set, but Frank would never make it to trial. He hanged himself in his cell, somehow managing to do that from a hook that was 5 foot 7 inches from the ground when he was 5 foot 8 inches tall, and an autopsy discovered that he had 6 broken ribs, all of which had been broken during the time that he'd been in police custody. Frank was later cleared of all the charges, but that couldn't bring him back from the dead, and it couldn't take back what he must have gone through before he died. In total, there were 12, some say 13, official victims of the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run, but some put that number in the 20s. Others, like Peter Merillo, who continued to work the case for 18 years, once said to the press that he believed that the killer had a much wider reach than they'd investigated at the time. He tied the Kingsbury Run murders to similar murders that had happened in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, going all the way back to the 1920s. Dismembered and decapitated bodies and heads were found mainly in an area that was then nicknamed Murder Swamp, and they only stopped in 1934 when residents stormed the swamp looking for the murderer themselves. 
They started again in 1939 and continued until 1942 when they finished for good. But the break in between would coincide with the string of the Kingsbury Run murders and the burning of Kingsbury Run in 1938 would explain why they started back up again. The railroads connecting the locations would have made travelling between them fairly easy and may have even provided a place for the murderer to kill his victims before he disposed of the bodies. To this day, the case remains unsolved, with many believing that it was Dr Francis E Sweeney who committed the murders, and there are others who believe that investigators never came close to ever finding the killer. If there was even just one at all, and not a few killers, who all disguised their murders to look like they'd been committed by someone else. For now, it looks like we'll never know for certain who the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run was, and we can only hope that the significant improvements in technology and investigative approaches would stop this from happening again and identify the Mad Butcher.